Hi everyone, in this video we're going to go through everything you need to know in Unit 3 for AP Calculus. And check the description below where I've put other videos that I've recorded on some of these topics. So let's get to it. First is the chain rule. And the chain rule is used to find derivatives of composite functions. So let me give you an example of a composite function. Let's say you had y equals f of g of x and you wanted to take its derivative. So to find the derivative of y, you would need to take f prime of g of x, and now here comes the chain rule part. You have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So that would be times g prime of x. But what you can do to help you with a chain rule is to make every single derivative problem a chain rule problem. So for example, let's say y was simply f of x. You should still think about this as a chain rule problem and take y prime as f prime of x times the derivative of the inside function, which would just be times one. So the best thing you can do is think of everything as a chain rule problem. Now on to implicit differentiation. Implicit differentiation is used for equations like this. Notice that it's used for equations where y is not isolated. The first step is to differentiate both sides with respect to x. And when we do that, we need to apply the chain rule to all terms with a y. So let's go ahead and do that with this equation here. The derivative of 4x would be 4. The derivative of minus y squared would be minus 2y, but now we need to apply the chain rule to the term since it has a y. So it would be 2y times dy dx. Plus, the derivative of 5y would be 5 times dy dx equals, make sure to differentiate each side. The derivative of 7x squared would be 14x, and the derivative of minus 12x would be minus 12. In step two, we're going to collect all terms that have a dy dx to one side and all terms that don't have a dy dx to the other side. So this term does not have a dy dx. I'm going to subtract that over to this side. This term, let's keep on that side. So I would have minus two y times dy dx plus five times dy dx equals this stays on this side since it doesn't have a dy dx, so 14x. And then remember, I wanted to take that 4 and subtract it over, so I would have minus 16, and that is step 2. In step 3, we factor out the common factor of dy dx. So from this side, I would factor out dy dx, and in parentheses, I would have minus 2y plus 5 equals 14x minus 16. In the final step, we solve for dy dx by dividing. So we are going to divide both sides by the quantity negative 2y plus 5. Therefore, the final derivative of y with respect to x is going to be 14x minus 16 divided by negative 2y plus 5. If you needed to find the second derivative, you would want to repeat the process of taking the derivative of this function and substitute in dy dx. What I mean by that is in this case, you would need to find the derivative using the quotient rule. And when you did the quotient rule, you would end up having a dy dx when you take the derivative of this term. And in the place of dy dx, you would substitute in this fraction. Now on to number three, taking the derivative of an inverse function. And if f of x is one to one, meaning that function would pass both the vertical line test and the horizontal line test, then f of x has an inverse. But what I wanna talk about is how to take the derivative of its inverse function. So what I like to do for this is I like to organize my information in columns. So let's say I have the function f of x and I have its inverse. And let's say f of x has some random coordinate pair a, b. Well, that means on the inverse function, that point would be b, a. So those x and y coordinates would flip. Now, we always find derivatives at x values. So in this case, we would be taking the derivative at a. But over here with the inverse function, I would be taking the derivative of the inverse function at its x value, which is b. Let's say the derivative of the function at a is some number m. Here's the most important thing. The derivative of the inverse function is then going to be the reciprocal. So if this is m, this will be one divided by m. 
So slopes at inverse points are reciprocals. How about derivatives of inverse trigonometric functions? This is also something you want to make sure you know. What if we wanted to take the derivative with respect to x of arc sine of u? And something to make a note of is that arc sine of u means the same thing as when it's written like this. So just know they can be rewritten as the same thing. So if I want to take the derivative of arc sine of u, that would be 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared, but then you would need to do the chain rule, which is to multiply by the derivative of u. So a lot of times you will see this derivative rewritten as u prime over the square root of 1 minus u squared. How about the derivative with respect to x of arc cosine of u? Well, I'll tell you something. It's the same thing as this, just negative. So once you know one, it's easy to remember the other. And then the other one I would make sure to know for the AP exam is just one more, and that is the derivative of arc tangent of u. And in that case, it would be positive 1 divided by 1 plus u squared. And then again, make sure to multiply by that chain rule of whatever your u is. And then lastly, we have higher order derivatives. Now, we already talked about the second derivative in terms of that implicit differentiation problem. So we talked about a higher order derivative there. What I'm talking about here is not just finding f prime, but how about finding f double prime? Or what about f triple prime? Or how about anything beyond that, such as the fourth derivative of f of x? These are all called higher order derivatives. I'd love to go through some of my favorite higher order derivatives. Let's say f of x is e to the x. And what if we wanted to find the 50th derivative? Well, since the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, it doesn't matter how many times I take the derivative, I would always see that the derivative is e to the x. How about something that is a little more complicated but has an e in it? So let's say f of x is e to the 3x. Let me start by finding the first derivative. f prime of x would be e to the 3x, and then you'd have to use the chain rule, which is to multiply by the derivative of the exponent, so we can write that as 3 e to the 3x. Well, if you take the second derivative, you would have 3e e to the 3x times 3. So you would have another 3. And then if you found the third derivative, you'd be multiplying another 3, each time doing the chain rule. So if I had to find the 50th derivative of f of x, well, that would be 3 times itself 50 times times e to the 3x, or 3 to the 50th times e to the 3x. And then I have one more favorite, and that's if f of x is either sine or cosine. And let's say I wanted to find the 50th derivative of sine of x. Well, there's this pattern that happens with sine or cosine. So if I start with sine of x, the derivative of sine of x is cosine x. The derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. The derivative of negative sine of x is negative cosine x. And the derivative of negative cosine x, you may have guessed it, is sine of x. So it has this repetition, this repeating pattern. So if I want to find the 50th derivative, well, here's the first, second, third, fourth derivative. So every fourth derivative would end up back at sine of x. So every fourth would get me to the 48th derivative. So then this would be the 49th, and then this would be the 50th. So the 50th derivative of sine of x would be negative sine of x. And those are a few of my favorite. All right, that's a great review of Unit 3 for AP Calculus. I hope that helped. If it did, give it a like. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe. We'll see you in the next video, everyone. Have a great day.